Well, good morning, uh, people of St. John's. Um, I'm Peter Floyd, I'm the rector. And uh, joining me today is John Horn. He's our senior warden at St. John's. And during our last vestry meeting, we thought it would be helpful if um, we got together and just recorded a little session between the two of us to bring everybody up to speed at St. John's on some of the things that have been happening behind the scenes at our church. You may uh, remember in the past that I would do state of the church forums. Well, um, we're just going to be sort of like that, only um, it's got to be done over video, of course. So I'm looking forward to talking with John and um, just getting you all up to speed on some of the things that have been going on since uh, we were last able to get together. Um, so, John, thanks for joining me today. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Why don't, why don't we just start off with talking about um, the vestry itself? Obviously, we're not able to meet in person. Um, you want to just tell us a little bit about what's happening there? Absolutely. And, uh, you know, kind of reflecting on this, and it's hard to believe that the last time that we actually were face to face in the same conference room at St. John's was back in February. And um, just think of all that's happened since uh, we last met. But I think from the parishioners' standpoint, the important thing that they should know is that um, we have continued to meet, um, even though we cannot meet on a face to face basis. Um, we have utilized Zoom which is the, um, the audio video um, conferencing system. So when we can sit in front of our computer screens like we are now and um, see each other across the screen, and um, we can have and conduct our, our vestry meetings. And we've been doing that now since um, our March meeting. Coming out of the March meeting, I think it's um, important for the parishioners to know as well that um, as we were entering that lockdown stage and uh, you know, North Carolina's mandate was back on March the 27th, that um, we felt going four weeks before we next met was, um, was too long. Um, things were happening fast and rapidly. And um, so we elected as a vestry group to meet on a weekly basis. So um, every Sunday at five o'clock, we would get together such as this and um, hold a vestry meeting, review the status of the church from your perspective. and. Um, talk about parishioners that we were concerned about and how could we reach out and support them. And uh, so we've been very active um, as a vestry group since the lockdown. Now, in addition to the vestry group, I think it's also important that people know that the finance committee um, has also been meeting. So the financial well-being of the church is, um, is in good hands. It hasn't been at all neglected, um, along with the property and grounds and I know that we will hopefully talk a little bit about that committee um, in a short while but um, all the other kind of standing committees associated with the life of the church Peter they've been meeting on a continual basis so um, as senior warden I can reassure our parishioners that um, St. John's is in good hands and it is being cared for and it's being well maintained. Right. One of the questions I got about the vestry, John, was, you know, can we meet virtually? Is that legal? Is that something that our bylaws allow us to do? And we haven't talked about this, but the good news is they do. Um, we needed to have passed a resolution allowing us to meet virtually. And that was done when our bylaws were updated a couple of years ago. So not all parishes in the diocese have that, but, um, but fortunately, St. John's was on top of updating its bylaws and we are um, good. good to go on that front. So good news. Thank you. So, Peter, I'm going to ask you a question because, as I mentioned, one of the concerns of the vestry were, um, were you know, our parishioners, not all of them uh, are in a situation where they could get out into a garden or go and enjoy the outdoors. Um, They're kind of locked down, if I can say it that way. Um, so can you share with us um, what you and your staff have been uh, doing from a pastoral care perspective? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Uh, obviously, that's where I spend a good bit of my time these days. Um, everybody being locked away has affected people in all sorts of different ways. And, and life goes on. Um, there have still been people who have gotten sick for other reasons. No one in our parents has gotten sick from uh, the COVID virus, um, which is great news. Now, we've had parishioners who have had extended family or even very close family um, who have um, gotten sick and even died which is deeply sad. And so there's been that level of pastoral care. But, it, but as you know, John, one of the first things we did at, when we had that first meeting as a vestry virtually, we immediately said, um, 
how do we take care of our parishioners? I mean, who are we as a church? That's sort of the thing the vestry comes back to when it makes decisions. And St. John's is a caring, loving community. We know that and we embrace that um, charism about our parish. And so we immediately wanted to move forward and talk about uh, how we could stay connected to one another because that's such an an important thing for St. John's. So the vestry literally just divided the directory up amongst themselves and said, we're just going to call everybody. And then we've continued to do that as, as we move forward. So you probably, hopefully, if you're one of our parishioners, have gotten a phone call um, from one of our uh, vestry members. If you haven't, um, check into the office and make sure we have your number right in Realm and that everything's okay. Just want to uh, make sure we know how to get in touch with you and keep that going. So the vestry just sort of was checking in with everybody. Um, and then the clergy and our pastoral care team, people may not even know that we have a pastoral care team. But there's a committee of folks that consists of, of course, the clergy, Brad, Wendy, and myself, um, Carol Clark, who helps direct us. She was a former um, parishioner who was over parish health and is a nurse. Um, and then the Jillian and Matt um, are, uh, and Alcera are part of that as well. And we sort of talk about what we've heard um, and we sort of try to, uh, we each sort of have a little hand in a different world. And so we sort of gather that information together and um, share it with one another from what we know. And we make sure that people are followed up on and reached out to that. We sort of know what's going on with each person. And then of course, information just comes into us through all sorts of different means. And a lot of it's just making a phone call these days and checking in on people. Um, We have uh, parishioners who are in hospice. We have parishioners who um, are just struggling during this time. And that grief and anxiety is sort of coming out in different ways. Um, And so, um, we're trying to figure out some creative ways to manage that. We also uh, started a card ministry. Uh, Dana Burgess, who's on the vestry, just, I don't know, the spirit moved and she wanted to take that on. And we just were so in- encouraging of her to do that. And now she's got about 30 or more people who are sending cards to parishioners. Um, and, you know, I don't know that there's any rhyme or reason particularly behind it. Obviously, if they know somebody has a need or if they know someone shut in or struggling with a difficult time, they'll get those. But then they're sending them to people just because they, their name came to them and they felt like sending them a card. So uh, it's such a blessing to have that ministry uh, going on as well. Um, we also had lay Eucharistic visitors before this. So we're taking communion to people. Obviously, that has um, stopped. But um, that ministry continues just by phone calls. So I know that people, lay Eucharistic ministers, usually develop some sort of a relationship with the people that they take communion to. And so that um, element of their ministry continues the relationship piece. So they're calling them, checking in on them, making sure that they're doing uh, okay. Um, one of the things that Brad and, uh, and our pastoral care team uh, talked about a little bit and that we hope will be coming up, this is sort of news to people. It may be news to you, John. Um, one of the things we want to do is have um, some sort of a forum much like this where there's a Skype chat among three or four people. And so it would be Brad and I and um, several therapists and people who are, are deal with psychology in different areas. And there's one that's a family psychology and different things. Um, and we'll want to talk about what's going on with um, – grief and how we're managing our grief during this time, because this could be, that sort of thing can happen. This is a sort of a traumatic experience, if you will. It's obviously more traumatic for some than others, but, um, but it's a group trauma and not just with St. John, but with the entire planet. And I don't know that anything has really happened in the same way as this before. Um, obviously there've been world wars and things like that, but this is really quite global and everybody's experiencing something very similar. Uh, and so that can project itself out um, in different ways. And the thought too is when this ends, or as it starts to sort of end, and we're around or we're moving around in society, and as you know, our government has like a phased approach. And as we move into those phases, what can we expect to feel emotionally? How might we react to other people as we sort of move out of this? Um, I want to wear my face mask. For me personally, I think that's important for me. Um, but when I see other people not wearing one, um, you know, how do I feel about that? And um, just to sort of be aware of my own emotions and how I can relate to people and still be a caring, loving Christian person uh, as we move forward and as we sort of experience that um, residual uh, emotional stuff that comes as we move through these phases. So I'm hoping that we'll be able to do that soon. And that'll be something that you can watch, much like you're watching this. 
And so that'll be helpful. So the hope is to offer those kinds of pastoral programming things as we move forward to get good information to folks. So, good. yeah. No, I appreciate you sharing that. Yeah. The, just one concern that, that I have, and uh, this technology is wonderful, but I, I fear for some of the people that we're talking about may not have access to this technology. So I know the greeting cards that we've been sending out are touching base with them, but um, is there any other thoughts that you have? How, can, how else can we communicate? Yeah, you know, um, Wendy, our deacon, is actually calling every, we have a list of people who um, don't get email. It's our don't get email list. We've actually had this, this list for quite some time. Um, and so we assume if they don't get email, obviously they don't have a computer and mm -hmm. th this sort of means. So Wendy, our deacon, is calling them every week, just touching base with them. We also print off the announcements and send those to them so that they have that level of connection. In fact, sure. that, um, that happened even before the pandemic struck us. So, um, so they at least have a form of announcements. They're getting a phone call every week. Somebody's checking in with them. And we're sort of trying to meet those needs as we move forward. I tinkered around with the idea of what if we could just put the sermon on a voicemail box and they could just call into the church and listen. I haven't quite mastered that technology yet, but there's some creative ideas that are being thought about uh, out there for how could we just use the old fashioned telephone. Um, but we're, we're still learning as we go. So, Well, the one person that um, I've come to, to know quite well and have a lot of respect for, is Jamie, Jamie Graves, that's behind all this technology that we've been using. But uh, yeah, I'm sure he'll find a way. And one of the par parishioners, and I don't think he'd mind me mentioning his name, um, that I uh, that we get a lot of uh, questions about is George Mertz. Obviously, George. everybody knows George. He's a sort of stalwart. He goes to every church service <laughs> that we have at St. John's. And uh, we want to know how he's doing. Um, and, you know, it's not easy for him. It's not easy for anybody who is um, sort of... Um, locked away in their, in their um, particular facility. Um, but, you know, he's okay. I've spoken with him recently, and, and we are working on actually getting him a cell phone. We had an old cell phone. We just sort of have been putting our heads together to figure out how that could work. And so Jamie, in fact, is taking an old cell phone. We're going to rig it where it's really simple to use, and we're going to get that to him so he can now participate in Zoom meetings with his Bible study and, and watch the church services and Excellent. things like that. So, um, again, man, we're just trying to, figure it out and let's, let's for one person at a time as we move forward to uh, try to be a, have a loving, caring response for each parishioner. Well, I think a lot of people would join me when I tell you, Peter, that I think you and your staff are doing a wonderful job in uh, reaching out to all of us. So I appreciate that, John. keep up the good work. Well, of course, it's not just St. John's parishioners um, that need reaching out to. Um, obviously, the entire city and our world is going through a very difficult time. So, John, why don't you tell us a little bit about what's going on with our outreach efforts? Um, I know we've done several things and we announced a few things, but maybe you could speak to that a little bit. Yes, very much so. So, no relationship to me, but um, everyone knows Susan Horn, and uh, with an E. But uh, Susan is the chair of, um, of our outreach committee, and uh, she reached out to, uh, to the vestry um, just a couple of weeks ago um, with a request. and. Um, Really, the request came from both Matt Williams and also from Susan. Um, there were three particular ministries that um, were very much in, in need. And the first one was Galilee. And, uh, you know, all the parishioners, I think, at St. John's understand and know who Galilee is. And um, we have been supporting them for a long time. But um, they are serving out about 360 mils a week. And um, there's obviously a cost to that. But they've estimated that those number of mills could expand to beyond 600 a week. And um, there's a cost of around $10,000 to support that ministry. So um, out of our endowment funds that are specifically set aside for outreach, um, $5,000 was, um, was given to, to Galilee Ministry. So that was one. The second one is the... Um, the men's shelter, um, the urban ministries. Um, just imagine how many people would kind of on the street um, find themselves in a situation of, um, you know, no home, no place to go to, looking for a roof to burn over their head, 
So with the city of Charlotte, they have been inundated with such people. And um, they've had to, in essence, turn away volunteer groups that were bringing in food and other supplies because they were banned from going into the um, facility. So that ministry on its own have had to finance the support of the men's shelter. So um, I believe it was about 1,800. Uh, let me just find the right number, Peter. Um, it was $1,814 um, were given to the urban men's shelter ministry. And then finally, the Charlotte Family Housing Ministry, um, they have also had an influx of people um, to the point where they could take no more. And um, they have been looking for support housing, um, even to the point of taking these people into to motels and, um, and supporting them that way. So an additional $2,000 was also uh, given over to that ministry. So within the last two weeks, um, St. John's has paid out about $8,814 um, to those three ministries. Now, I'd also like to add that um, in our 2020 fiscal budget for St. John's, um, we put $10,000 into that budget to support outreach. And because of this um, you know, unprecedented situation we find ourselves in, um, the vestry has gone to Susan and to the outreach committee and said, look at that $10,000. How would you recommend to us that, um, that we spend that money and support other ministries? So we're waiting to hear back from uh, the outreach committee and um, hopefully we can report very soon that we've actually spent another $10,000 in support of our community. Wow, that's wonderful. Yeah, I think that uh, 10,000 for outreach out of our operating budget was the first time St. John's has done that in many years. And, and what, how fortuitous. Um, and, and the one year that we would need to do that more than any other um, in probably the history of our parish, um, we've been able to do it this year. And, and that is such a blessing. To, I'm so proud of the vestry for stepping forward in faith and giving that money. Uh, where it is so needed most. And, and I know that Brad and I both have discretionary funds and we're, um, we are both looking into what we want to give to uh, and how we can do that um, easily with uh, right. particular financial pieces. as well. So beyond just the, um, the 8,000 so, uh, or almost 9,000 from the endowment and then the 10 from the budget, Brad and I are giving a good bit of money as well. So it's a significant piece that's coming from St. John's moving out just financially into our community as well. Yeah, and it, as I said, it's very much needed during this particular time. So um, thank you, St. John's. Yeah, yeah. Peter, if, can we move on to um, online worship? Um, sure. You know, I think for, again, all of us, I think the last time we stepped inside the nave at St. John's was, was back in February, maybe early, very early part of March. Um, it seems to be a lifetime ago that um, we were able to do that. But um, once again, you know, technology has uh, allowed you to, to reach out and conduct a Sunday worship service um, and also other worship opportunities during the week as well. Um, can you just speak to us about how have you done that? Um, I know it's not easy because I, I spent uh, one day with you doing three lay readings and uh, kind of got an opportunity to go behind the scenes, which I really appreciated, and then thank you for allowing me to do that. Yeah. But um, I'd be interested in you know how you do it, and also what has been the response? What's been your feedback from uh, our, our worship opportunities? Yeah, you know it's interesting that first time we did it, um, you know I think the decision came on like a Thursday, and you know and it was sad um, because we didn't get to have a last Sunday. Right. You know, uh, a time where we sat in the pew and sort of knew that that was going to be the last time for a while. So but there wasn't really a chance to, to say an, an in-person goodbye. Maybe that's, I don't know, in hindsight, maybe it's not such a bad thing to rip the Band-Aid off. But, but on a Thursday, getting ready for a Sunday, I mean, the bulletins were printed. Um, and so the, the first thought was, well, what do we do? And so Jamie and I sit down and and. Jamie obviously is a computer whiz and knows these things in and out, but, but I'm 
no slouch on the subject either. I've live streamed before. I've done all sorts of stuff, um, you know, video editing and all those things um, at other parishes. So I said to Jamie, listen, you know, what are we going to do? Um, my concern for him immediately was, I appreciate that we could live stream like we always do. You, you may know that some people may know that St. John's live streamed at services before we went um, uh, sort of away from our building into full online. Um, but I said, uh, my concern is, is that when we start doing this, everybody, not, you know, in the, on the planet just about is going to be live streaming. And the, and the easiest way to do it is through Facebook Live, which is how we were doing it before. It, it really isn't a big deal at all. Um, but my concern was, one, people are going to be dependent on this for their primary source of worship. So it needs to be something that's good. And two, I'm concerned that um, the bandwidth and, and Facebook servers aren't going to be able to handle tons of people live stream. And part of my reasoning for thinking that was because in the past, I've had it sort of bog up and not work. And so I was concerned about that. So he and I, and he was too, it was his first thought as well was, you know, that's really risky and it could all lock up and it could go away. So we said, well, the safest thing to do is to pre-record it and then, and then post it to Facebook and YouTube and let those things premiere on Sunday so that we have control over the environment and what's going on um, so that the product we produce is something that can be well done for people who are having to use that for their primary worship service. And, and you may know that I'm, you know, Facebook friends with lots of clergy. I mean, it's ridiculous. Um, so I've served in all these dioceses and I have all these seminary friends and we're all Facebook friends. So um, their live feeds all feed. <laughs> I'm like on Sunday morning, I have like every church in the world seems to be live feeding into my Facebook feed. And I've seen basically anybody on the East Coast that live streams before, say, nine o'clock seems to be doing well. But if you're central time zone or mountain, um, it, it does. It lags up on people and um, it cuts out and people are really, it's very difficult. Um, if you have a 10 o'clock service in the central time zone, it's, you're just almost out of luck. And uh, so people are having to quickly go to Zoom as a backup for their congregation. It's just, it's been really difficult for those folks. So I'm really pleased with the pre-recording. But in order to do that, of course, the church looks like a movie set sometimes, um, and we've got cameras and things. And and um, and what we're really lucky is is that Jamie um, owned personally a lot of equipment that we were able to borrow microphones with multi-directional arrays and editing software. That's I mean, really great stuff. And so he's just jumped in there and been putting things together and helping us work all this stuff out. We, and we've had the choir come in and sing some things and. And really the, the hope was just uh, to get something that looked good going and, um, and then, you know, to get us through Easter and then Easter came and went. And then you can sort of, if you've watched them over time, you see that after Easter, we sort of rethought some things. And one of the things we really wanted was to be, how, do, how can we have more people involved in this? You know, normally on a Sunday, there's acolytes and lay readers and ushers and, you know, you see lots of people. And so, We've moved to having um, different people recording themselves at home, um, doing the prayers of the people um, and doing um, uh, d different readings and things so that we can then use the advantage of our ability to pre-record and bring that stuff in so that what you see on a Sunday is a meaningful worship experience for you. And, and hopefully we'll see more friendly faces as the Sundays go by. Um, so I think that, that was meaningful. Now, a lot of people have wondered about, um, well, how are we going to get out of this, right? What's it going to look like when we start to go back? If you've been paying attention to the government and the things that are coming out, you'll know that um, just in fact, a couple of days ago, um, the governor said that there's phase one, there's basically 10 people, which is what we have now pre-recording. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's phase two, which is more people, but he didn't say what, I'm guessing it's like 50 or so. I mean, I, I have no idea. Or it's some capacity of your church to hold. That's how restaurants are, 50% capacity. So what that means to us, I don't, I don't know yet. And then the third phase is you get more and, and so on and so forth. So what would it look like? What would that look like for us? Well, the diocese has formed a group of people um, to have some conversations around that. I'm on that group. and We have our first meeting on Monday. So it'll be talking about what those phases look like for us 
how we can be um, assured that between now and the time we get a vaccine, church is a safe um, and meaningful place for us to come, be together, um, but be together safely for all of the people that attend there. So we're looking at that. Obviously, um, um, what you may not know, um, in fact, nobody probably knows this unless they one of the few people that have been in the church building, is that before we went um, away, I mean, when I, we thought before that Thursday that we were still going to be in church, I had Jeff order hand gel stations. So, you know, you go in a restaurant, you squeeze the little thing in gel and you wash your hands. Um, and so we have lots of those around. So when you come to church next, you'll see lots of hand gel stations that, that will be available. Um, we've got um, um, the ability. Um, uh, Jeff was telling me that there's a device that will mist and that is a disinfecting mist. I don't know. It just <laughs> That's it. So we can sort of disinfect between services. And the thought was when we sort of get out of this, the preschool can use these things as well um, uh, on an ongoing basis because obviously, you know, preschools and schools um, need a deeper level of cleaning on, in, a, in a normal environment. Right. So we're hoping that when we are, are able to come back, we'll be able to provide um, some social distancing, maybe every other pew. Um, you know, there's still some questions about confirmation, how that's um, going to work in the future. Obviously, it's not going to be this. I mean, normally in May, we have that. That's not going to happen in May. So how does it happen moving forward? That's going to have to be discussed. Baptisms are a challenge. Mm -hmm. How do you baptize someone? Um, you know, do we move to sort of an emergency baptism thing? Can we have services outside where it's, um, there's more ventilation and more sunlight, apparently, as we just heard, uh, right. is helpful. So all of those things, I think, um, are important uh, questions, and um, uh, that's sort of being managed at a diocesan level. Uh, I'm on that committee, and we'll, we'll have that information as it comes out. So people have asked about funerals, um, and we do have parishioners who, um, you know, aren't doing well, uh, not because of COVID, but for other reasons. Mm -hmm. So there've been some plans to simply um, uh, gather the family by Zoom and have a short service, just a reflection with the family because they can't travel in for the funeral. Exactly. So to have something by Zoom with the family and then just sort of postpone a larger service that would be more typical to what you would expect at St. John's uh, right. until uh, we were able to get back together. So it may be that, um, 2021 or or so we might we'll up doing a lot of funerals because uh, they'll just be sort of backed up waiting on on that or memorial service i think under special circumstances we are able to actually inter people so if someone wanted to have a graveside service or something like that with just a handful of folks that can happen so it's tough we're, we're working on all the different ways to sort of make um, decisions that are safe and, and best for people um, but that's, that's where we are at this point. And the response, at least from the online worship piece, has been good. I think people are just so appreciative um, that they are able to come together and connect with one another. Um, last Sunday, we, we scheduled it for 10 o'clock, and it was so fun to see people commenting, peace, 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 you know, during, the, during that particular part of the service. It was, it was great just, just to know that, you know what, I'm doing this, and it's weird, and it's in my house. But other people are in that same boat. Mm -hmm. um, maybe I can't see them, but, but right. I can see that they're commenting, and I know that they care, and they're with us in some way. And that was so meaningful. So. And it was like part last, you know, put this past Sunday, um, the um, the prayers for the people, you know, being read by the family in the garden. That was a really nice kind of touch and uh, kind of nice change of scenery. Well, I don't, I'm not sure when people will see this video, but this Sunday it's the Walkers and their kids are involved. There's the family who sits on the front pew. Um, so that should be fun to watch uh, and see what, what happens there. It's, it's, it's really enjoyable to, uh, uh, to see uh, people getting involved and wanting to be connected. And a lot of people are coming to our Zoom meetings, our daily office meetings, and it's uh, people who maybe wouldn't have done that before because they were just too busy. So part of the things that we've been asking ourselves is moving forward. How do we want to move forward and keep the good things that we've learned, um, but do it in a way where we're still together and we still have what we used to have, which is so important to us. We want to get back to that, that, that togetherness that in-person worship, which is so valuable, where we can actually receive communion um, in the way that we're used to receiving it. Um, and, uh, uh, but, but what might we keep moving forward? Might we have a Zoom uh, thing in the adult forum where you're able to Zoom in, or maybe you're able to Zoom in more often to your Wednesday night Bible study or, 
what might that look like? Right. So we'll, we'll have to experiment as we sort of move out of these phases. Thank you. Yeah. Appreciate you sharing that with us. Well, to move on a little bit more, um, I know one of the things that some people have asked about, John, is the um, capital campaign. Where mm -hmm. are we with that? I mean, obviously, we were in the middle of this campaign. We we're talking about our building. Things were actually really going great at St. John's before we hit the brick wall. Um, and uh, I thought maybe you would talk a little bit about that. I know we have some slides to share with folks. Yes, we do. So I will go to my screen share here and just get this. And there we go. So. Well, uh, there's a lot of good news um, that I'm going to share. So first of all, um, that top line, you can see that we have $591,657 that um, has been pledged um, to St. John. So very nearly $600,000, um, which I think, if I'm correct, has taken us up to the B classification of, um, of projects. So. Um, it's been a wonderful start. I think, unfortunately, right, as we kind of launched this campaign, um, the lockdown came. And uh, I'm sure that um, you know, that's had somewhat of a negative impact. But um, nonetheless, I think this is a wonderful start um, for the rejuvenation of our spiritual home. So of that amount of money that's been pledged, I think it's important if you go to the second line, you can see that um, there is $317,400 that we actually have. That's money that um, we can actually go ahead right now and spend, right? That's, that's outside of the pledge for the next uh, couple of years. And of that amount of money, Peter, we have spent $81,550. Um, and that has been all on the stained glass. And um, I believe you have some slides coming up um, that we can uh, share with all the parishioners. So um, that leaves us with 235, nearly $236,000 in the account um, with another 270, which is um, expected to come in over the next two years, which is that pledged money. So um, I'm going to ask you um, in the next um, element of that conversation is um, of that $236,000, how do we plan? How do we kind of move ahead and identify how we spend that and how we do invest that into our building. So um, a great start to the yeah. Rejuvenate campaign. That's great. And maybe explain to people where this $44,000, what does that mean? That, that came from our uh, operational budget. So this was um, monies that um, was sitting, if I can put it this way, sitting to one side that um, was there to be spent into the building. And, um, the finance committee and the vestry approve the transfer of that funds to come over into the rejuvenate. So in essence, it was like the church's contribution, right, to the rejuvenate um, funds. Correct. It was from a designated account, which people may not know what that means. So just think of it like a like one of your savings accounts. And you uh, were going to spend it on the building probably anyways, but we just gave it into the rejuvenate campaign so that it could be managed under that portion. Correct. Yeah. So do you want to go through some of these slides? Um, yes, please. So tell us what we're looking at here. So if you are familiar with the Columbarium area, um, there is a, um, a very nice, um, what can I, it's like a, um, an architectural um, donation made by a family some years ago that um, if we come back, you'll see the cross, etc. cetera. Um, but it was under really poor rip. Pair. Um, all the marble you can see was breaking away. Um, water was getting in between the cross stand and the uh, the center part right in there. Yeah. Water was seeping into um, the underside. And I think your next picture will show the water damage. There we are. Look at that. Yeah, this was so all this under there. You may know this is all mold. That is exactly, that is mold that... Um, had seeped in there over this period of time. So it really was in, uh, in very poor, poor condition. And here it is finished. Um, this was finished just a few weeks ago. Um, it has been water sealed, so there's no opportunity now for uh, to that water damage. And um, in conjunction with this, that entire columbarium area um, has also been power washed 
and um, just cleaned up and it is looking very, very attractive right now. So this is the sort of before and after you can see yeah. this little water retention pool, which had a drain in it was just eliminated. So you wouldn't have any water go in there. I'm not sure what the design feature was, was that what that was no. about at some point, but so, and obviously the, the marble was replaced with a lighter substance. that's similar. So that got all cleaned up. Okay, nice job. So here is uh, some photographs of the power washing and um, there's been a, uh, a good group of um, volunteers from St. John's that have um, got together during the course of the weeks prior to the lockdown. Um, and uh, look at the steps here, just the before and after. And this is the effects of, uh, of power washing. So David Dwyer and uh, you know, his team of uh, merry men have been working diligently here around the church, you know, conducting and doing all this pressure washing. And, what a difference. Um, when the parishioners can get back at long last to see this, um, they will see a, a significant difference in the, in the, you know, just the well-being of St. John's. It's an amazing difference. Then obviously a lot has been happening with our stained glass as well. Yeah. So we've got some so, slides to show there. I did get a little, I did all the work myself. You can see me right there. There's proof. Uh, so um, if, if you if everyone realizes the last time that we were all together sitting in the nave um up behind the altar was the scaffolding yeah right and um the work platforms and they were working on the main window here so um that is now all completed um the total of 50 days um was the amount of work working days that it took to complete all the various stained glass windows around the around the church and in this, in this picture here you can see some of the lead um, which is holding the stained glass in place um, you can see how that's deteriorated the picture yeah, this on is a the right this is a before and after and there's the after so nice and secure there a lot of work Staying, lots of scaffolding around different places these windows are that are on the side of the church. Um, I think I've got a better picture of that. We had um, glass coverings put over them, and you can sort of see just a little reflectiveness. Yeah. I actually think they look better, but water obviously came down the roof, and uh, sometimes the gutters overflowed, and it really washed out these windows. So now with those coverings, uh, we're all nice and dry inside the church. So, that's yeah, really so all of those nine nave windows, um, Peter, all of those were secured with additional... Um, clear glass. Right. Looks really good. Um, people may remember this photo from the campaign brochure, yeah. but as you can see um, on the after, yeah, the it's after. all nice and um, repainted and um, Re sealed up. So that's looking great. Um, and then here's a before and after on uh, the uh, Tilson Hall window. Yeah, it, lo it, it looks brand new, doesn't it? It, it really does. It's quite, it's quite something. a very, very nice job. Significant improvement. And then um, all of us that um, go to church, I'd say 99% of us um, would walk through what we regard as the main entrance off the parking lot. And um, the picture on the right is um, what we recall seeing each um, Sunday walking into the church. Um, and I'm really proud to say that one of our parishioner families um, donated the funds to restore that canopy um, and that's what you're looking at on the left hand side um, it has been cleaned it has been waterproofed and um, it has just been brought back up to um, to a current standard and um, we are extremely grateful to um, to the family that donated the monies to um, to renovate the canopy so um, no longer do we have to accept seeing the mildew and the mold on the on the canopy over our main front door so uh thank you for uh, for that contribution yeah absolutely it's such a wonderful gift um it's a shame the building looks so nice and shiny and nobody's able to go nobody's to it able to go and see it but one day that will happen one day that will happen well thank so, you Peter, for um, um thank you for, but i just wanted to mention just really um one last thing here, so $81,000, just over $81,000 um, was the total cost of 
repairing, right, and rebuilding um, and repairing all of those stained glass windows at St. John's. And um, it includes the children's chapel. Um, I want to tell the children that um, Noah's Ark is no longer going to leak. Um, it's been plugged up. So, um, no, seriously, all of the stained glass windows now are, are all in prime shape. Yeah. So, um, so moving forward, um, you know, as we put our budgets together for, for the years to come, um, we just have to make sure that, um, you know, we, we budget monies um, for the upkeep of the building. I think that is vitally important moving cool. forward. Absolutely. I know that's a topic that's heavily on the agenda of the finance committee and the property committee and trying to figure in conjunction with one another um, how to put a, a process in place where we don't have to do this again anytime soon. So, yeah. So Peter, so talking about, you know, the windows and the rejuvenation, et cetera, um, you know, there is much work to be done. And um, I, I would like to ask my final question of you, um, and that is to talk about, I, which I believe um, to be a very important committee um, for St. John's, and that is the Property and Grounds Committee. Um, this is the group that's now been charged, right, to, um, to give direction for the repairs and the upkeep. So I wonder if um, you wouldn't uh, take a few minutes before we close um, to speak about this important committee work. Yeah, one of the things that uh, happened soon after my coming to St. John's and at least after I got my feet under me a little bit was Bo and I sat down and I said, you know, hey, is there a property committee or a building and ground committee? You know, is there something like that? And he was like, well, there, there used to be, I think, I don't know. You know. And I thought, wow, you know, this is a big building <laughs> and it's got a beautiful garden. And I know there's like folks that work on the garden and there's a comparium and then there's, you know, the preschool and who makes decisions about this? Is it, and it turned out, well, basically it was the rector. You just tell us what to do. And I, I thought, well, uh, um, you know, I'm no property expert. So um, it's, it seemed to me that most churches have a property committee. And in fact, St. John's had that in the past. So we started talking about how could we put that together and how could we really do a deep dive into certain things. And in, and in the midst of our conversation, obviously the repair of the stained glass window, um, was brought up and was noticed. Um, and in fact, it was even a work before I got to St. John's and there was like a list of three or four things that were obvious. But in our conversations, we said, you know, we really need to know what the total extent is of what's going on here. I mean, how do you, how do you fix a, if you don't know that B is worse than a, um, so where do you spend your money? So, um, uh, and in the same time, we did have a finance committee and the finance committee was trying to figure out how it could be most helpful. And so I immediately said, well, we need to figure this list out. We need to know what we're dealing with financially. And so um, folks on the finance committee began that charge while we started putting a property committee together um, uh, who could specifically manage property and think about property moving forward. So as Bo and I sort of began to put the property committee together, we just asked ourselves, you know, who, who should be on the committee? And immediately we thought, well, we need representatives from different places. Um, so we need someone from the preschool, we need someone from the youth, um, we need somebody from uh, the garden, um, we need obviously people who know about property, the facility manager, rector, those people ought to be on this committee, the junior warden, obviously. Um, and so we've done that. We, uh, 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 we have folks from each of those places um, on the committee, um, and people who understand property, understand um, process. We also have some crossover between property committee and um, uh, finance committee. Um, they're, they're sort of attending one another's meetings. Um, some people are just to, so that there's a good communication piece happening back and forth. Um, so, so that's helpful. Now, um, where are we at this point is... Um, the property committee is formed. It's met. It actually met in person a couple of times and now it's meeting online. Um, and we have just, um, are about to wrap up the process of finalizing our recommendation to the vestry of the order in which we think we ought to do things. So, um, uh, what will happen is we'll put that list in order. That list will go to the vestry. The vestry will say, um, yes, we approve or 
change this or whatever it wants to say, and then that will have the final sort of uh, approval of, of what we're going to do and in the order we're going to do it in. In the midst of all that, you also have the finance committee, and the finance committee needs to help us understand what the um, process is by which the building committee or the property committee can um, get approval to do its project. I mean, obviously, we don't want to have to write a check request for every nail that we need, you know, every you know, paintbrush, yep. but, we, um, but we're trying to figure out the best way to, to do this. Is it by project? Is it just uh, how many estimates do we need to get? So the finance committee is soon to put a sort of process in place so we, uh, as the building committee, can know this is the procedure we're going to follow as we work down our list, and then we'll have the list in place. So I hope that will all happen very quickly over the next couple of weeks or so, and then we'll have our list, and then we're going to begin working on things and moving forward. Um, it seems, you know, that the building is vacant. Let's do some work. Um, and so the list may move around. We may want to do some work that's sort of high impact that we would want to do when people aren't in the building. You know, I've been thinking about road work. It's like fix the roads now, Charlotte, you know, right. while we're not driving on them. So we want to do some things that, that people may, you know. Yeah. Um, uh, Maybe in act cases like painting, right? Right. Well, some the things that would be areas. disruptive to our life, it'd be nice to be able to do them now. Yeah. But we also want to be good stewards and say we know that there are sort of, in the campaign we had A list, B and C, and A was the things that were really scary, like the gutters were overflowing and that was causing foundation damage and there's water infiltration and, and some of those things. Now, obviously the windows were at the top of the list and that we just moved on quickly. Right. Um, and the Vestry and Property Committee, Finance Committee, were all like, do it, do it. But now we're like, well, you know, do we want to fix this roof? And if so, that has about two more years on it or do we want to put that off? And But we want to make sure we get to it. So some of those questions we're really struggling with um, in particular, what's the smartest order to do things? If you're going to get a lift out there to pressure wash the sort of black marks, if you've seen Jamie's drone footage float up, you've seen these sort of streaks, it's like, well, that would have been good to clean. But, you know, if we're going to get a lift to do that, let's also get a lift to paint some of the wooden eaves on Tilson. So some of, you know, let's do it all while we're out there at the same time. Some of the parking lot lights are out. Let's fix those while we have the lift out so we don't have to rent the lift four times and pay a deposit each time. So we're trying to think of that the smartest, most economical way to do some of those things. Um, and that, that's just going to take some time. Um, but, but ultimately, that's the order we'll do it. The, the list will get approved. Financial committee will tell us uh, how we can um, uh, acquire bids and, and get funding for this for, from that pool of money that's been donated. And then the vestry will give its final stamp of approval. Then we're off to have uh, people coordinate some of the stuff. And if we all can all get back together, I know that they will have some opportunity for parishioners to do some things as well. If you have a skill, um, and some of these things re require very little skill, I'm cleaning out stuff, hauling things away. Um, uh, obviously, we have our pressure washing crew that's been uh, working hard on things. Exactly. Um, we may have some people help us paint and stuff as we move forward. It's all um, uh, all just sort of beginning to come together, even though we're away. I up for painting. Yeah. Give me a so, paper. Yeah, so lots of things happening at St. John's, even though um, we're not in our building. And I thought that, um, you know, I, I just appreciated this opportunity to get together because I'm very conscious that and aware of all the things that are going on at St. John's. And um, I think this has been a wonderful opportunity for us to, to sit here this afternoon and, and, and chat about them and um, to bring us, bring us all up to date from a you know, parishioner standpoint, so yeah. uh, they know exactly what's been going on during these difficult times. Yeah, I hope this answers a lot of people's questions. And let me just say, if we didn't answer your question, feel free to shoot me an email or John, um, okay. and we we'll obviously give you an answer if you want something more specific on one of these topics or something else we just uh, didn't talk about. Uh, again, you can find our information through Realm. If you don't know how to log into Realm, get in touch with Laura Pruitt or somebody on the staff and we can make sure that you're logged in and know how to um, contact us. My information is all in Realm. If you need to get a hold of me for any reason, that's where you can go. Um, and as and John's, mine too. John as well. Mine's so. there. Right. Peter, if, um, if there's nothing else for us to chat about, um, could I ask you to, uh, to close us out with a, uh, with a closing prayer? Sure, I'd be happy That would to. be quite applicable. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for the good people of St. John's and for the joy 
of being a community, even if it's virtually. We ask for a measure of your grace as we move forward as a congregation, uh, for wisdom as we make decisions about um, helping people and um, repairing what has been broken. We ask for your blessing upon all of us as we care for one another in pastoral care and as we um, do the work of your kingdom, even in these strange times. Bless us, Father. Bless your church. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Thank you. Great. Thank you, John. Thank you, Peter. I look forward to seeing you on Sunday. All right. God bless you. Thank you. You too. Bye-bye.